World War I leads to World War II as day follows night. By the end of World War I, everybody is looking to get advantage. World War I didn't really end in 1918. It brutalized an entire generation of Europeans. It brutalized an entire generation of people around the world. And it made them realize that war on this scale was not only possible, but actually thinkable. There's a wonderful, wonderful political cartoon where the fat politicians and generals are walking out of Versailles and there's a little tiny boy and he's crying in the corner. And I'm not kidding, he says, I'm cannon fodder for 1940. They knew, anyone with half a brain knew that the Treaty of Versailles was essentially the starting gun for the Second World War. Essentially what happened is that you create such an unstable economy and so much animosity between nations that you're just seeding the field of war to rise and grow again. A lot of the anger, animosity, resentment that fuels the rise of the National Socialists of Adolf Hitler in Germany can be directly tied to that. It would be difficult to argue that that's simply propaganda that's utilized by Adolf Hitler. These were very difficult terms for the German people to, to handle. And it creates this bunker mentality, this us against the world mentality that ultimately will play out in Hitler being able to create a program that appeals to that sentiment. To the average German, they have been sold out by the politicians. In particular, it made people like Adolf Hitler, who had fought, after all, in the German army in World War I, think that if only the Germans could do it again, but do it right this time, they could actually win. We call it World War I, World War II, but it's really two different stages of one global conflict. It just happens that people put their arms down for a 20-year period, and then they went back to fighting again. And of course, some people do view it as that, you know, the fact that World War I, World War II were almost on top of each other, yes. So anyway, welcome you back, of course, Daniel Simon at Baton Rouge Community College. Hope you're having a great week out there. Uh, hope you're doing great. But uh, anyway, um, so uh, yeah, this week I'll be kind of moving to focus on, of course, World War II. Uh, of course, a very interesting topic, which, you know, caused a lot of mayhem, you know, killed, a lot of people were killed, of course, in World War II, if you know. So we'll kind of talk about that this week, and I'll probably finish up World War II next week. Uh, of course, of course, we've got the weekend coming up later uh, in the week. So anyway, uh, looks like we have a bunch of students watching. I know live right now. It looks like Brooke, hope you're having a good morning. Uh, and also Vincent's also watching live uh, right now, along with Melva, uh, Olivia, good morning. Uh, Ziangpu, and also looks like Paige is also watching as well. Uh, also in StreamYard again is, uh, of course, Madison uh, as well. Uh, and it looks like uh, Chelsea's also joining us uh, this morning uh, as well. So, you know, I'll kind of talk about a few things like announcements. And, of course, I'll dive, in, of course, into uh, the topic of World War II today. But um, I think you've got a bunch of assignments out that are kind of important you'll need to kind of work on. I know you got the second exam. That's the main thing you'll need to kind of focus on uh, right now and get that out the way. Uh, of course, World War I quiz, uh, that, of course, due later. Not right now, but probably, I'm guessing, more closer to spring break. Uh, third vocab start is due starting this Friday. I usually give you a week on that, but um, like this, this Friday, the next Friday, uh, you have a bunch of days to, of course, upload that uh, the Canvas so I can grade those. And then... Yeah, the book reports due starting next week. I think it's April 11th when it's, I know, the beginning due date, but I'll stagger, you know, the, the upload times for when you, when you, of course, can post that to Canvas. Usually give you about a week to post that assignment. Uh, like, give me more time to grade it, too, as well. So um, that's something I need to, I'll probably send out announcements about by the end of the week coming up. So uh, anyway, just that's, that's enough about announcements. Uh, but uh, of course, today, like I said, I'm going to, of course, move on to focus uh, on, on the famous topic, of course, of World War II. Uh, of course, I'll kind of get in today. Uh, we'll talk about like the early stages of the war. I'll kind of discuss, you know, how, how it breaks out, you know, when Nazi Germany invades Poland. We'll get into that uh, today. 
Now, kind of get into like the early stage of the war. Uh, of course, we'll see you know, uh, Britain, I think, and France fight, of course, uh, Nazi Germany initially. Uh, of course, France gets knocked out of the war. We'll also talk about the Soviet Union. They they come into the war in 1941. And also, I will get to, of course, the United States today. Uh, we enter the war, of course, because of Japan taxes, of course, uh, in the Pacific. And so that's, that's how the United States uh, enters World War II. So if you have any comments, you know, questions during the live stream, let me know. Or you can, of course, always leave me comments, you know, questions later on my channel. Uh, you can also subscribe to my channel below uh, as well. So uh, anyway, um, from last time, I kind of have been talking about the rise of, you know, fascism between the wars like Adolf Hitler, uh, Mussolini, uh, of course. So that's kind of part of why World War II Happen. I'll get to Japan too. You get the rise of the Empire of Japan, of course, in Far East and in Asia, and of course the Pacific. So I'll get get to that later. But of course, we'll focus first, like I said, uh, on the beginning of of, of World War II, uh, of course, in Europe. And of course, a lot of that had to do with what happened with Poland. But uh, before before that happened, there were some other things I did want to talk about uh, before you know you have the outbreak of you know World War II. Uh, in Europe, but uh, Germany uh, made some uh, alliances and various treaties throughout Europe right before uh, the war actually broke out. There's this thing that you may have heard of called the Pact of Steel. Here it is a signing of it right there on May 22nd, 1939. Uh, that was a deal made uh, right before uh, Nazi Germany invaded Poland uh, with, with Italy. It was kind of seen as this... Um, military alliance that they created, political alliance, which kind of helped seal the whole, you know, Axis powers that we had talked about before. And it was a 10-year agreement that was supposed to last from like 1939 uh, to 1949. Uh, and uh, I think also uh, Italy kind of wanted this mutual agreement to get aid from, from Nazi Germany uh, and all that. Uh, however, when uh, World War II broke out, uh, if you know what happened, uh, Italy stayed neutral until 1940. And that was, of course, until, I think, you know, Germany invaded France. That's when they uh, entered the war. But uh, usually the Pact of Steel is kind of important because they do think it later leads to the so-called tripartite pact. Of course, you've heard about before, maybe, uh, which was signed in 1940. And that kind of solidified the Axis powers, you know, the alliances that would be really in World War II uh, between Germany, Italy, and Japan. Uh, they would fight against the Allied powers, of course, uh, in, in Europe and the rest of the world, the United States, uh, et cetera. So that was initially created. Uh, of course, you find out later Italy is not that great militarily compared to Germany, and Germany's kind of shackled to a corpse, uh, more or less. But um, they had this other agreement, of course, that Hitler later made, makes with, of course, the Soviet Union, uh, which had all kinds of names. I think some people call it the so-called non-aggression pact between uh, Nazi Germany and Soviet Union. Uh, it's also called the Molotov-Rippentrop pact because of the two foreign ministers uh, that were involved. Uh, v. Molotov, of course, the Soviet Union, and uh, uh, Joachim von Rippentrop, of course, of Germany. Uh, Treaty of Non-Aggression, that's usually what they call it, between Germany and the Soviet Union, signed on August the 23rd, 1939, which, by the way, was kind of something that the West was kind of surprised about, that this actually happened, because, you know, the Nazis hated the communists uh, in all this. But part of why they did this, uh, by the way, uh, was because of the fact that Germany was getting ready to invade Poland. And so uh, they were kind of concerned about having to fight a two-front war uh, and all that. And so the two two nations uh, uh, agreed to basically split Poland uh, if um, Germany invaded Poland. And so you get the eastern half, and the Germans would get the western half. And then what nothing had happened to was interesting was that Hitler decided to give uh, control of the Baltic states, like Lithuania, you see, Latvia, Estonia. They would give that over to the Soviets, and they would come in later and take it over, uh, those areas. But I think the main thing, you know, the fact that they didn't have to fight a two-front war, that's one of the main things that really I think Hitler was kind of more concerned about because uh, of what happened in World War I, uh, where Germany had to fight east and west against, you know, Russia, 
uh, and of course Britain and France. Uh, besides that, uh, there, there of course uh, Stalin was kind of smiling. You know, he thought I don't have to fight Hitler for ten years. You know, until 1949. Uh, of course, that would that would prove to be wrong. Uh, of course, we'll get to it later. Uh, the Nazis turned around and they invade Soviet Union in 19, June of 1941. Of course, so that may have been the turning point of the whole war, though. I think if maybe Hitler did not invade the Soviet Union, World War II may have been different. So yeah, you got the uh, of course the Nazi the, the German invasion of, of Poland. That's the that's the main thing, of course, that really sparks uh, World War II, uh, which of course occurs on September 1st, uh, 1939. Uh, before Hitler uh, did this, he had already been planning like an invasion of Poland, going back to they think to the spring. Uh, of 1939, uh, they had an invasion. They had actually a, a, a plan that they had by the way to uh, invade. You see, there, Britain and France going to declare war on them. You know, for invading, invading, uh, you know, Poland. And um, I'll get to it in a second here, but um, they think that the whole invasion of of Poland uh, was a plan that was part of a um, operation that they called. Fall Vice, or also known as, uh, they call it sometimes Case White, uh, is another name they call it, which is the translation of it uh, from German. And the idea was to invade Poland from uh, multiple uh, locations. Uh, kind of go back to this map uh, that's up here. Uh, but uh, if you look at this map here, that orange area, of course, the area that they would invade and take over, uh, the Germans are able to invade from Czechoslovakia. Uh, Greater Germany or you know, Germany to the west, where Berlin is, and then also East Prussia uh, on the Baltic Sea. So basically, Poland is invaded from three different directions. Uh, and then on top of that, you got the Soviets coming in, of course, from the east uh, as well. So the really the the really the, the the Poles were they were they were they were pretty much screwed in this war. Uh, and yeah, the, the allies in the West backed them. Like when the war broke out, you know, Britain and France would back Poland, but they really couldn't do anything about it because uh, the, they got overrun uh, at that point. So the, inv the invasion of Poland basically sparks World War II, which really, I guess, really starts September 3rd when France and Britain, you know, declare war on Germany uh, at that point. And so that's that's why you've got this different you know alliances in there at that point. You've got basically France and Britain uh, fighting Nazi Germany initially. Uh, you'll have other allies that of course will come in later uh, that of course be involved. Uh, now part of why Poland fell so fast uh, was because of the fact that the Germans used a new form of warfare uh, that the media or news media newspapers started calling it. Blitzkrieg, or what they call lightning war. Uh, it was a new kind of German tactic of offensive style warfare where uh, they use tanks, you can see there, which they call panzers, the Germans, uh, aircraft, uh, things like that uh, were used, lots of trucks, uh, but they still had to use like animals, like horses and things like that to move stuff around uh, as well. And so the media kind of used that name, although Hitler kind of didn't really like the term blitzkrieg, but that was a term they used, especially up for the first few years of the war. And for at least two, three years, the Germans were almost unbeatable uh, on the battlefield until really 1942, 43, when the tide really, really changed uh, in, in the war. So Poland gets overrun and they're practically wiped off the map uh, at that point. Uh, but the war, war has pretty much started uh, Poland, I think, only lasted like three, four weeks, and that was about it. So there, there's there's a good map showing you, you know, the actual invasion, of course, of Poland, uh, which started. You can see the Soviets began to come in, in mid-September uh, and take over. But yeah, the Poles, they didn't really have a chance, the fact that they were in, being invaded from four different sides uh, at the war. Now, what's really weird about the war uh, is that there's kind of like this lull in it that kind of occurs after uh, Poland fell. Uh, they usually call it the so-called phony war. It's not spelled wrong. I, mean, one of, I, mean, I know in American English, they spell phony without the E, but that's the British uh, English uh, phony with an E. 
Uh, but yeah, it ensued uh, afterwards, which was like an eight month lull that kind of starts right after uh, Poland fell, like in September. So I guess from September up to like maybe about April of 1940 uh, is the time period of it. And uh, it looked like maybe the war wasn't going to happen. Like in the West, uh, there was even a joke going around uh, that uh, they call it the sit, sit down war, I think was another name, or I think the German version of Blitzkrieg they used was Sitzkrieg, I think is what they called it. Uh, and uh, a lot of people thought that uh, Hitler just wanted pulled it and that he, was, he wasn't he was going to attack the West. And of course, that proved to be wrong, of course, later by the spring. And I think Hitler was just waiting for the winter to fall. But uh, they did go, to, had some other conflicts that kind of broke out uh, in World War II uh, that were famous. Uh, what's really weird was in uh, Finland, they, they, they had a war breakout uh, between the Soviet Union and Finland that lasted about three or four months, from November 1939 uh, to March of 1940. And um, Finland um, wanted some land that was, I think, close to where uh, uh, St. Petersburg is or Leningrad. Uh, and Soviets uh, invaded, trying to push them away uh, from Leningrad. And uh, they fought over this uh, isthmus that was called the uh, Karelian, the Karelian uh, isthmus is what it was called. Uh, and Finland is one of these powers that kind of switched back and forth in the war. Uh, they started out hating the Soviets, if you know about this. Uh, and then when Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union, uh, they switched to the uh, German side. Uh, and then when I think when Nazi Germany started losing at the end of the war, uh, they switched back to the Allied side. You know, so go figure. But uh, that war was that that war was pretty bloody because of the fact that it was fought in winter conditions. And uh, Hitler really thought that the Soviet military was terrible because they they took high casualties in the war. In fact, they suffered more casualties than the Finns did uh, in the war. Uh, and so they, I guess he, he thought later that he could invade the Soviet Union and knock it over. And that proved to be, of course, wrong, of course, later. Uh, but, yeah, they also had a deal where what happened was the uh, Germans then invaded Denmark, which was a kingdom, uh, and then into Norway uh, as well, uh, which they started this in April of 1940. Uh, and so he, he pushed northward into there. I think Britain tried to put forces in there, but they had to withdraw because uh, they were outnumbered. Uh, and so both both those areas fell. Uh, the Germans wanted control of, of Norway and Denmark to control the Baltic Sea, like the western arm of it. Uh, but also they wanted to uh, be able to uh, get a lot of minerals and uh, stuff that Sweden had. Sweden had a lot of minerals like iron ore and things like that uh, that they wanted and so that was the reason for it. And I, I guess also they could attack the North Sea and things like that and have air forces in that region as well. Uh, and so that was an area that was kind of vital, I guess, to the Third Reich in the war at that point. Oh, when the Nazis went into Norway, they put in this um, Norwegian named Vidkin Quisling. Uh, he was this Nazi collaborator that headed up their government from 1940 to 1945. And um, Quisling later, if you know about it, uh, was seen as a traitor uh, to the uh, Norwegians. And uh, today, um, the word Quisling means traitor a lot in Europe. We still kind of use it today, you know, about that. Uh, now, after that, Hitler then, then began planning to invade uh, the West, uh, which he started doing over the winter between, I guess, 1939 to, to 1940. Uh, and um, that one had also uh, a code name, too, they used, which was uh, Fall Gelb, or Case Yellow, uh, which was Nazi Germany's invasion of Western Europe, uh, which would in include, like, uh, Holland, uh, Belgium, France, Luxembourg, uh, would all get invaded and conquered by the Nazis uh, in World War II. And uh, that man on the uh, top left you see there, that's uh, Eric von Manstein. He, he was a famous general under, under the Wehrmacht, the German armies in World War II. They consider him to be one of the best generals under Hitler. And they talk about Erwin Rommel and all that uh, as well, but uh, he was considered one of the best 
generals they had in the war. He had this plan called the Manstein Plan, you may have heard of, uh, where it was kind of a variation of the Schlieffen Plan a little bit, uh, where a Schlieffen Plan was like number that, that number one sickle cut, you see, uh, going down into Paris, which the Germans tried in World War I, uh, which failed. He wanted to do the opposite, which was a more of a sickle cut number two there, going through uh, Belgium up through uh, northern France where Calais is, you see, and that's what the Germans would do. Uh, and uh, if you look here at this map, uh, the French had built like a string of forts on their eastern frontier with Germany that was called the Maginot Line. And so what the Germans did was they went around it. And so uh, what, what, what they actually planned to do is that the Germans decided uh, what they would do is that they would attack through the Ardennes Forest, uh, which was a kind of a forest in northern France and Belgium. That was really the weakest spot on the Allied front uh, uh, in the Western Front, you know, with the French, the French and the British. Uh, French were down, like I said, on the Maginot Line, and then the British were in Belgium. And they mostly had like some troops in the Ardennes, but it was basically a weak spot because the Allies thought that nobody could break through there, you know, with tanks and all that. But what happened was Hitler uh, gambled in 1940. Uh, the Germans put about 80% of their tank forces uh, through the Ardennes Forest. Uh, and so uh, May 10th to about May 14th, May 15th, I think is the dates that were kind of important <clears throat> in the West. And uh, the German forces broke through. Uh, so-called Battle of Sedan, uh, which happened that second week of May. And uh, from there, uh, what happened was the Germans then raced uh, westward and upward toward basically the English Channel. So you can see them kind of racing westward uh, there. Uh, the French and the British tried to counter with this um, plan called Wagen's plan. Wagen was a French general at the beginning of the war. Uh, where they tried to counterattack and prevent the breakthrough uh, right there, but it failed, and the Germans are able to race up, you can see, uh, towards where uh, the city of Calais is <clears throat> in the uh, northern part northern part of France. Uh, of course, what ends up happening is uh, British and some French forces uh, basically get surrounded in what they call the so-called Dunkirk pocket, you see, uh, in that whitish area, which was part of like uh, northern France and also Belgium, right where Flanders is right there. Uh, and so the BEF, which is the British Expeditionary Force, uh, majority of its forces get surrounded, uh, and along with also the French First Army uh, as well. And so basically the Allies got cut in half on the Western Front uh, in 1940. And it's part of why, of course, the Germans won. Uh, that, that campaign in the West and would end up taking France later. That was all part of the so-called Battle of France. Uh, they called it uh, between May, May to June. Well, the British at this point realized that if they don't get out, they're gonna lose all their main forces uh, that they have. And so the Germans uh, <clears throat> were able to kind of, for some reason they backed off on them, which was kind of dumb about that. They, sh they should have ran them into the sea, but they didn't. But what happened was the British began evacuating forces in what they call Operation Dynamo, uh, which happened late May uh, to uh, about May 27th to about June 4th of 1940. Uh, the British under uh, Winston Churchill, who had just taken over their government uh, in London, uh, decided to make this mass evacuation using all kinds of ships, uh, any kind of ships, whether it be warships or uh, just civilian type ships that were brought in uh, to evacuate uh, their forces. And so in a, a period of, like I said, about a week, about a week is what it was, uh, the British were able to get out about almost 340,000 troops. And so the media later dubbed it the so-called, they called it the um, so-called miracle of Dunkirk because uh, of the fact that most of the evacuations took place at the city of Dunkirk uh, on the English Channel. 
And so they kind of consider that to be a turning point in the war because a lot of these soldiers that, you know, could have been, you know, captured, they would have captured all those men. That would have been pretty much maybe the end of the war for the British. Uh, they had to leave all their equipment behind, uh, you know, guns, uh, you know, horses, uh, trucks, tanks, whatever they had, uh, basically. And most of these got out with their lives uh, at that point. Uh, there's a lot of images, of course, of, of Dunkirk. Like you can see men lining up, uh, you know, trying to get ready to wade into the water to get on ships. They've made a lot of movies about it. I know a few years ago they made a movie called Dunkirk, which was pretty good. Uh, that kind of shows you how difficult it was for soldiers just to get out, get off the beaches. It was, it was really, really pretty, pretty difficult. Now, um, so yeah, Hitler, of course, what's going to happen is because of the fact that, you know, the, the French forces are reeling at this point, uh, the British, the British have evacuated. Uh, and so, yeah, the Germans keep coming. Uh, I think they talk about the fact that the Battle of France, which is a lot of times called the Fall of France, but a lot of people call it, um, they pretty much rout the Allies in just a few weeks. And so Paris, Paris falls on, on June 16th. Uh, you can see Hitler uh, there, and that's some of those images right there. Those are kind of black and white images of Hitler uh, touring Paris, like the Eiffel Tower on the left. Or I think he actually went to visit uh, Napoleon's tomb as well uh, in Paris. Didn't learn much from Napoleon, I guess, 1812. We'll see later. Um, that's something he has found. The only time he ever visited, by the way, Paris uh, during the war uh, was, of course, in 1940, uh, right there. Now, uh, one of the things that would happen after, of course, France uh, fell, uh, France, of course, would officially surrender on uh, June 22nd, 1940. If you remember correctly, back in November 1918, November 11th, uh, the Germans had surrendered in the forest of Compiègne. Remember that? And they had that rail railway car uh, showed you uh, where they were forced to sign uh, humiliating, which Hitler thought, you know, at that point. Uh, and, um, and so Hitler made them get the railway car out when they, they had signed uh, back in 1918. They made the French eat crud. Uh, that's what they did in 1940. I think Hitler later had the railway car blown up uh, after they, of course, uh, signed the agreement between you know, both sides. Uh, here's a map showing you what happened to France uh, after the war. They divided France, of course, up uh, into um, different zones. Uh, the northern part uh, became like what they called occupied France. Uh, and uh, the Germans had occupied through most of the war, I think up to like 1943, 44. Uh, Paris kind of remained like the capital of that area and it kind of remained an open city in the war. Uh, that is one thing that's famous about Paris. It wasn't bombed in the war like some of these other cities like London, Berlin, uh, et cetera. That's why I guess Paris is such a famous city to go visit of course, in Europe still. And then the southern southern part, you know, the southern part of France, of course, uh, they had this puppet state uh, where, of course, the Germans were kind of somewhat unoccupied there, but uh, they created this uh, pro-Nazi puppet state uh, they put in power, uh, which was called Vichy France, because it was named after the, the capital of that state they created, uh, which was uh, Vichy, Vichy, the city of Vichy, uh, and um, that state was actually led by uh, Philippe Petain, uh, the old lion of Verdun, uh, who was brought in as the head of state or chief of state of that. And they had prime ministers that were part of it, like Pierre Lavelle. Uh, and uh, they had to basically um, side with the Nazis in the war, collaborate with them somewhat. And uh, Petain later got in trouble for that. You know about that after the war. I think he was put under house arrest. It was seen as a, you know, as a traitor. Uh, and um, Batane had an authoritarian state, by the way, uh, which was very conservative. They reversed a lot of liberal policies uh, that the French had before. He was later forced to uh, round up Jews, if you know about this uh, in the country. So I think something like 70,000 French Jews were sent to like concentration death camps because of the Nazis. They were round up, of course, later. And Germany, by the way, held like something like, Two million French soldiers as POWs uh, during the war uh, afterwards. 
Uh, of course, one of the big things that happened after, of course, the fall of France was that Charles de Gaulle, who was a famous uh, French general, fled the country. He refused to capitulate you know, to Hitler. And so he fled to London, uh, where he set up a government exile, uh, which was called Free France. And uh, it included also uh, a um, military force. You can see he was later president of France after the war as well. But he had this uh, force he created called the Free French uh, Forces, uh, you see there with him. And uh, they fought alongside the Allies in, in World War II. And um, that's, that's their, uh, their logo, of course, which is the Cross of Lorraine, uh, the symbol of the, of course, Free French Forces uh, and all that. So they'll be there with like involved like later on with like D-Day when, when the Allies invade uh, to take back France and the Germans. Uh, they'll be they'll be involved, of course, with the British, French, and other other allies in the war. Now, uh, of course, one of the things that happened, you know, about this at the beginning of the war was that uh, Britain switched prime ministers, which, uh, if you remember correctly, uh, we talked about Neville Chamberlain, who had been, of course, uh, back in. 1938 with the whole Sue Dayton crisis. Uh, remember, uh, peace, peace in our time or whatever. And uh, pretty much uh, Chamberlain was discredited, you know, because <clears throat> of what happened <clears throat> at the beginning of the war. Uh, and so he was also ill. Uh, uh, Chamberlain had cancer. Uh, and so he was, he knew he was dying. And so they had to put someone else in. And so, yeah, they put in Winston Churchill and uh, if you know about Churchill, Churchill was famous for a lot of his speeches. Like one of his first speech he gave, of course, on May 10th, of course, 1940, he said, I have only thing, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. Uh, I think at the beginning of the war of 1940, he gave like several speeches uh, that were, of course, well known. Uh, of course, one of the most famous speeches he gave, of course, was the one you may have heard of, uh, which is, uh, We Shall Fight on the beaches. Uh, I do have a, um, by the way, a little uh, excerpt from that I'll kind of share with you, of course, from that speech, but it is considered to be, by the way, uh, one of the most famous speeches uh, probably ever given in World War II. Uh, the only one I could think of that might be bigger, just just about, is probably FDR's Day of Infamy. You notice that bit, of course, with the New World, of course, he's talking about the United States maybe coming in later. I'll help out because, yeah, that was one of the darkest periods, of course, in British history because uh, from 1940 to 41, of course, the British had to fight alone. They didn't have any other allies that were kind of fighting Nazi Germany. And so, yeah, that's something he's kind of talking about, you know, their darkest hour at that time. So anyway, I'm going to talk, of course, more about what happens. Of course, the other thing that happens, of course, uh, at the beginning of the war is the Battle of Britain. I want to get into that uh, today. Uh, and uh, Battle of Britain uh, commenced a little later in July, July of 1940, of course, July to October, uh, considered one of the pivotal battles, of course, uh, in World War II. Uh, it was mostly an air battle uh, where the Royal Air Force, this is what they call the British Air Force back then, of course, still today. Uh, and then, of course, the German Air Force, which, of course, in World War II, they called it the so-called Luftwaffe. And so, that, yeah, those two tangled, of course, in World War II. Uh, might might be considered the first major battle of the war after the Battle of France uh, at that point. And um, kind of see here uh, the Battle battle of, of, of Britain. Yeah, uh, of course, yeah, uh, Germany had a huge uh, uh, air force, which I know in the Battle of Britain, I think they had like two, 3,000 airplanes involved, which uh, were a combination of uh, fighter planes and bombers. Uh, the British Air Force, the RAF, uh, had maybe about 14 fighters, uh, mostly consisted of like uh, planes like the, I think I've got images of the different planes that were involved in the war, but the, I know the uh, German side had the famous Messerschmitt ME 109, and then the, of course, the Spitfire you see on the bottom uh, was really considered to be one of the best type of fighter planes uh, at the beginning of the war. Uh, and, um, <clears throat> Hitler, Hitler had been planning, by the way, uh, to invade. Uh, there was this, this 
uh, we had this plan called uh, Operation Sea Lion or Operation Sea Low, which was this idea to uh, conduct an amphibious invasion operation to uh, possibly invade England. Uh, they're not sure how serious Hitler was about this, but the problem was he had to neutralize like their air power and things like that. Uh, and so he never really got to it. He, of course, had to postpone it, you know, because of the fact that the war didn't go go well uh, for for Hitler. And uh, the uh, RAF had an advantage because of the fact that the uh, they started using uh, a new kind of form of technology at the time you may have heard of called radar, uh, which radar was invented by different inventors. I know in uh, Britain they had a man named Robert Watson Watt uh, that helped invent it. Uh, and uh, it gave like the British like an early warning system of attacks that were coming in. And so uh, Fighter Command, like RAF Fighter Command, uh, divided up Britain's airspace into different sectors. And so uh, when fighters would enter a certain sector, they would then send up, you know, planes to attack them. And pretty much everybody's got that. Like I know in Germany, I think they end up with that also as well, radar. Uh, and so... And so, yeah, the Luftwaffe begins to bomb, um, of course, uh, Germany. Uh, Germany bombs like London and other cities in England, uh, you see there, which was often called the Blitz, or some people call it the London Blitz uh, as well. And so uh, civilian bombings, you know, happened pretty much starting in, you know, 1940 to the end of the war in 1945, which is part of why uh, World War II had such high casualties. Uh, in fact, the British suffer like something like 40, 50,000, uh, mostly civilians killed uh, in, in at the beginning of the war from 1940 to 41. They bombed a lot of their cities, like London, et cetera. And um, it was so bad that a lot of the uh, British had to evacuate. Like I, I know they took a lot of the children and evacuated them to like the countryside uh, as examples. Uh, also, people tried to evacuate, like maybe their cellars, but I know they preferred to evacuate to, like, the, say, the London subways uh, as an example and to hold out against, of course, Hitler's forces in the war. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, the Germans will keep, will keep bombing, of course, uh, England the war, including V1, V2 rockets, of course, uh, by 1945. Now, uh, due to uh, German air losses, though, uh, Hitler eventually is going to have to give up. That's one of the things that's going to happen. And so uh, he's going to focus. What, what, of course, one of the things that Hitler is going to do at that point, he's going to focus on, of course, attacking the Soviet Union, which uh, they'll do, of course, by the summer of 1941. Uh, so that's that's the next thing, of course, that's going to happen, of course, is that. This that, of course, occurs, which they think that's considered one of the major turning points, of course, of World War II, uh, is the fact that the Germans uh, declare war on Russia with so-called Operation Barbarossa, which I'm going to talk a little bit about today. Uh, Barbarossa, uh, which started in June of 1941, <clears throat> was supposed to be this short campaign uh, that the Germans were going to invade the Soviet Union knock them out of out of the war in a short, short campaign that was only supposed to last maybe like, I want to say six months at the most. And um, it would involve something like four million troops, uh, which were a combination of mostly German forces and other allies that fought with the Germans as well. Like, I think Italy had some force they put up. Uh, Romania, Hungary uh, also put up forces uh, as well. And uh, this started an um, invasion which ends up becoming, if you know about it, one of the bloodiest conflicts uh, in really World War II. Uh, because uh, if you know about this Operation Barbarossa in 1941, started the uh, <clears throat> Eastern Front, which the Eastern Front was really the most bloodiest front really in World War II, uh, maybe up to 30 million People were killed in the war, which uh, included not just soldiers that died in the war, uh, but also civilian deaths uh, as well. And uh, the Russians uh, called it the 
a uh, great patriotic war because if you know about uh, Napoleon's invasion of Russia in 1812, they called that the patriotic war, and so that that nickname was of course used. And uh, Stalin kind of becomes a hero, you know, in the war. If you know about that, because I think we talked about how tyrannical uh, his dictatorship was in, in the Soviet Union, but he's kind of rehabilitated in the war uh, because of the fact that you've got Hitler, who's you know, I guess worse than him. Uh, that kind of thing. You can see uh, the invasion starts on June 22nd. And you can see how the uh, German forces, they overrun uh, Eastern Europe, uh, pushing into uh, Poland. Uh, and um, and as, as the um, kind of get to it, as they go into Poland and parts of like Eastern Europe, like into like Russia, Ukraine, uh, Belarus, uh, the German have these uh, SS forces that they bring in uh, that are called Eitzengruppen. Eitzengruppen goes around trying to eliminate any bodies that's a threat to the Germans uh, in the East. Uh, Jews, like over a million, they think were actually killed uh, by the uh, Eitzengruppen. Uh, communists, uh, any kind of partisans that were fighting behind my enemy lines uh, were also killed uh, as well. They think that's part of the beginning of the whole Holocaust uh, in World War II because they'll start rounding up Jews and putting them in concentration camps uh, and eventually killing a lot of them you know, systematically, of course, but like death camps as well. But the Germans, the Germans overrun uh, multiple areas. Uh, like I said, they take over pretty much eastern Poland, which uh, the Soviets had at that point. They took over the Baltic states. Uh, as well. <clears throat> they took over Belarus, uh, Ukraine, and they even invade into Western Russia. And Finland, Finland at this point also comes in and joins also the uh, Germans in the war uh, as well in the East. Uh, they do have, uh, if you can see up top there, it's kind of hard to see, but uh, they do have the so-called Siege of Leningrad uh, that starts as well. And uh, the siege of Leningrad was one of the longest sieges of the war. Uh, it would last for basically more than two years, you see, for 872 days. Uh, it's considered one of the longest sieges in modern history. Leningrad, which is, you know, St. Petersburg, uh, was kind of trapped between the German forces and then also forces of Finland uh, that were in the north. And so uh, it led to a lot of... Um, mass starvation where a lot of a lot of um soviet citizens that were trapped in leningrad had lack of food and so i think there was a case where some even resulted to like cannibalism things like that uh because they couldn't get supplies in and things like that and so ended up killing like over a million people by the way mostly civilians so war, the war was tragic um, and the fact that a lot of civilians of course were killed of course in the war Uh, you can see here, here's kind of a better map showing you like the progress of the of the Eastern campaign, uh, how the Germans pushed eastward uh, into the Soviet Union. And you can see how Leningrad, Leningrad front up there, the central part of it, uh, east of the Gulf of Finland was almost surrounded too uh, by, by the Axis side. Now, the only thing was the uh, Soviets though counterattacked. That's the thing that happened uh, which occurs in the winter of 1941 to 42. Uh, Soviet forces had forces that were fighting in the Far East, uh, which initially, I think they kind of fought, fought a short campaign against Japan, but Japan decided to sue for peace uh, for the Soviets. And so the Soviets were able to get reinforcements from the East they brought in. And so they were able to use that to counterattack. Uh, and uh, it almost was the point where the Soviets were in reach of Moscow. They almost took it. Uh, but uh, apparently what happened was when the Germans were taking uh, the Ukraine, uh, they had trouble taking uh, the city of Kiev, uh, which you know is something that the Russians had trouble trying to take from the Ukrainians. You saw that. Uh, and so Hitler told them to go back and <clears throat> basically lift that siege and take the city, <clears throat> which they did. Uh, and so that that prevented really the the Germans from concentrating on taking Moscow, and so uh, that they think that was the Eastern Front ends up being a turning point 
uh, because uh, in the end, uh, what ends up happening is the Germans stall uh, on the Eastern Front, and the war is going to continue, you know, until the end of the war. Uh, this campaign, this pretty much this Eastern Front lasts almost four years, uh, which was not meant to be. It was only meant supposed to be a you know short campaign, and and so the Germans really weren't prepared for a long war with the Soviet Union. The Soviets were backed by the Allies, you know, Lend Lease Act and all that stuff, uh, and so it helped to help collapse the Nazi Germany later uh, by 1940. Five, because Soviets later invade, you know, of course, from the east and take take Eastern Europe, which I'll talk about later. Now I'm going to get next, uh, and uh, we're going to we're, we're going to of course talk about also the fact that the United States, of course, enters the war uh, as well uh, in 1941. Of course, December 7th, 1941, of course, of course, with the attack on Pearl Harbor, and. Um, that that's our, our considered really a major turning point, really in World War II, uh, when the United States comes into the war, because uh, our fresh troops. I think at one point the United States had about 10 million men uh, fighting in the war, and then our armaments, you know, our military stuff that we were able to you know make in the war, like armaments, munitions, and things like that, also helped to turn the tide. Uh, the Lend Lease Act or agreement, uh, where we gave war supplies to Britain, China. You know, Soviet Union, et cetera. That that helped also to turn the tide later, of course, uh, in in the war as well. But primarily, one of the major causes of why you know the United States gets in the war is not because of Germany. Germany, of course, has nothing to do with why, of course, the United States gets in the war. And it's of course because of the rise of Japan. So I'm going to, of course, talk about that today. Uh, that's that's considered the main main cause of why, uh, of course, we entered the war. On December 7th, 1941. So um, I'll kind of talk about it. Uh, Japan uh, became this fascist totalitarian state uh, that rose to power uh, really um, between the wars. Although we study about the Japanese Empire, it went back to really the 1800s. So they started back in the mid late 19th century. Uh, and uh, they have, of course, a famous ruler uh, that reigned during that time. I'll kind of show you a picture if I can find him. I think he's right there. Yeah, there he is. Uh, of course, Hirohito, you see right there on that white horse. He, of course, was the main ruler, of course, of Japan at the time. Uh, I think he's, uh, if you know about Hirohito, he's the one of the longest reigning rulers, by the way, of Japan. I know he's definitely in the top 10 of ruling rulers in the world, uh, period. And, um, reigned up to 1989. He was around a long time. In fact, the Allies kept him in power uh, after the war. And uh, later, he was only the only emperor left in the world. Uh, I think they still use the title emperor or the emperor uh, for the monarchs that rule Japan still today. Uh, and at one point, I think Hirohito was kind of seen as this living god that was on the throne. And so he had all these soldiers that fought, fought for him. That's why he did the bonsai charge, if you know about that. But bonsai, bonsai, you know, fighting for uh, Emperor Hirohito uh, and all that. <clears throat> and um, Japan, Japan, uh, if you know about this, became basically uh, a major power. And uh, of course, I'll kind of get back to this map. Uh, I'll show you right here, kind of showing the map of the Japanese empire uh, that you have here. Uh, Japan rose to power mostly through military victories. Uh, they, if you know about this, uh, Japan had um, defeated Russia uh, in the Far East. Uh, Russia and Japan were fighting, you know, for control of like areas like uh, Manchuria, Korea, uh, et cetera. And that Russo-Japanese War, where Japan surprisingly defeated Russia, so that's definitely one thing uh, that's there. And so Japan starts to become this perennial power, naval power. Uh, they even start to build up pretty good military forces uh, as well uh, in the war. Uh, and you can see also that Japan controlled other areas, uh, not just Manchuria and Korea, but also Taiwan uh, at one point. And then later in the war, World War II, you'll see that Japan will even start expanding too, like in the Southeast Asia, Eastern China, <clears throat> into uh, parts of the South Pacific uh, as well. And Japan wants to create this huge empire 
uh, like an Asia for Asians, I think was the idea of what they wanted. And a lot of it was because the fact that Japan, Japan lacked natural resources. That's part of why Japan wanted to uh, expand, expand their empire. Uh, And uh, so, you know, they already had, you know, Korea at that point, going back to the early 1900s. Uh, But what's going to happen to really start, I guess, progressing Japan to really uh, being more aggressive uh, is in 1931, where from Korea, uh, the uh, Japanese invaded uh, into Manchuria, uh, which is in north, north, northeastern China, and took control of it. <clears throat> and they created this puppet state out of, you see there, uh, that was called Manchuka. So that was the first thing that really uh, the Japanese uh, seized at that point. Manchuka was a pretty much a Japanese puppet state uh, that was put there in Part of why uh, Japan wanted Manchuria was because of the fact that Manchuria was was rich in natural resources like oil, uh, rubber, uh, and also uh, lumber like you know, wood. Uh, and so these were natural resources that Japan needed because Japan, like I said, lacked a lot of natural resources. Japan's mostly a archipelago of a bunch of islands, uh, but they lack, lack natural resources. Uh, now, over time, what happened under you know, Hirohito's uh, government uh, was that they got into a hot, uh, you know, war with the with the uh, Chinese, and you have this deterioration of Japanese Chinese relations occurs in 1937 uh, with the so-called Second Sino-Japanese War. Uh, they had a first one that happened in the late 19th century uh, prior to this, but this one was more serious war. Of course, from 1937 to 1945, uh, they do think that the Second Sino-Japanese War is considered one of the longest conflicts of World War II. There's even a debate about whether World War II started in Asia first and not really in Europe. Uh, and it is one of the bloodiest conflicts of World War II. People don't realize this, but uh, I think if you study about that war, uh, the casualty rates were second bloodiest. Uh, in, in the war. It was the second bloodiest front, really, of World War II, uh, where somewhere between 15 to 20 million people died uh, in the war, which included, like, soldiers and civilians on both sides combined. And so people don't realize that, but Hirohito, he killed more people probably than Hitler did, believe it or not, uh, from, from this war. People don't know that, but it's something that's kind of true, and they allies kept him in power after the war, uh, which is crazy, but they did. Um, of course, one of the things that's very, very famous, uh, if you know about it, the Japanese would invade eventually eastern China uh, as well and seize a lot of the cities. Like the capital, if you know about it, was Nanjing or Nanking. They, they seized that, of course, which was part of the Republic of China at the time. Uh, Beijing was seized or Peking. Uh, Shanghai was also taken by the Japanese forces and also Hong Kong uh, as well. And uh, the Japanese army's forces were known as the Kwantung Army. They were known for committing a lot of atrocities in the war, uh, which you may have heard of, such as the Rape of Nanking, uh, which is well known, which happened in uh, about December of 1937. And um, yeah, the Kwantung Army was not exactly a type of army that followed Geneva Accords, you know, treating people properly like POWs and things like that. And so a lot of cases where a lot of women uh, were raped and killed and even children uh, as well. And there's a lot of different numbers on the amount of people that were killed, of course, uh, by the Japanese uh, invading forces. But I think they put the numbers at somewhere anywhere from 40,000 to maybe 300,000. They're not really sure about it exactly, the numbers. And it's kind of something that the Japanese don't really like to talk about. Uh, today, uh, maybe they're kind of embarrassed about it. Uh, I want to forget about it, that kind of thing. Uh, but it's something that it's part of why the Japanese and Chinese, I, I think, still don't like each other today because uh, of the animosity that went back to, of course, uh, in World War II. <clears throat> but yeah, the uh, Japanese soldiers were notorious for like torturing and killing a lot of soldiers, like bayoneting them and stuff like that. Uh, they even had deals where they would. Uh, just cut people's heads off with samurai swords. Yeah, you see that right there. They even did that to uh, 
POWs, like British, American, uh, other forces uh, were executed in different ways. And uh, they even used a lot of POWs as slave labor, uh, like the so-called Burma Railway, uh, of course, built in Southeast Asia as an example, of course, uh, using slave labor. <clears throat> oh, the Japanese were also known for taking a lot of the women, <clears throat> like uh, Chinese women, Korea, Korean, et cetera, and using them as prostitutes, uh, which the uh, Japanese referred to them as being called comfort women. That's basically, I think, some China, I think that's Chinese soldiers that are kind of, uh, <clears throat> I guess, questioning them after the war and all that. But that's something that the, I think, Japanese want to forget too as well. Uh, now, one of the things that starts to happen, which is famous uh, at the beginning of the war, uh, is that the United States starts to give military aid uh, to the Republic of Japan. We start doing this in 1941. And uh, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, he was one of the main leaders uh, of, of the Republic of China. Uh, he was like, I think called Generalissimo was his actual title. He was like a general and kind of head of state uh, that was later president of China after the war. Uh, he later was forced to flee because uh, the communists took over China under Mao Zedong, you know about this. Uh, and so uh, the Allies began flying uh, men and supplies into uh, into China to help them out, like mostly the British and the Americans were involved in this. And so uh, from India, you know about this, uh, the uh, Americans and the British began to uh, fly sorties uh, over the uh, Himalayas, Himalaya Mountains, uh, which they called the Himalayas the hump, was the, was the joke about it. And um, <clears throat> they did this because of the fact that the uh, Japanese uh, invaded Burma and took it, also basically uh, threatening also like <clears throat> that in <clears throat> Thailand, basically. And so they had to fly, fly all these sorties over basically the Himalayas to get there, bring supplies, bring men in uh, and all that. And that's something that was kind of famous about the war. That was all part of the so-called China-Burma India theater is what they usually called it. And uh, they also had the flying tigers that, that was that was brought in too uh, in, in 1940. Uh, the flying tigers was this American volunteer group uh, that that flew uh, originally with the Chinese Air Force because Chinese Air Force was not that great uh, compared to the Japanese Air Force, which really at the beginning of the war in the, in the Pacific and all that was kind of superior to the Americans. Um, with their zero fighters. <clears throat> and um, anyway, uh, there was this uh, American general you may have heard of named Claire Chenault, uh, who was from Texas. Uh, he originally went to Louisiana State University on um, Baton Rouge. I think he attended there for, I want to say, one year, <clears throat> and then he dropped out uh, and joined the uh, U.S. Army. And uh, he was involved in the Army Air Corps, which is later known as the Air Force after World War II. <clears throat> and um, Anyway, the Flying T Tigers, uh, known as the American Volunteer Group, AVG, uh, went over there starting, I think I want to say in the spring of 1941. They began to aid aid the uh, Chinese against the Japanese. And I think at one point they had like something like three squadrons that were part of uh, the Flying Tigers, which later became a U.S. Army Air Corps that, that fought over there. But they were kind of initially helping out the Chinese uh, in the war. And um, there are a lot of famous flying tigers that fought fought in the war. Uh, you may have heard of uh, Tex Winter uh, was a pilot, of course, of the flying tiger. who's probably from Texas. Uh, you can see there. You may have heard of Robert Scott. He was very famous uh, with the flying tigers. He wrote a book later about his experiences with that called God is My Co-Pilot. I don't know if you ever read that, but it's a pretty good novel about that. And then uh, Gregory Boeington, also known as Pappy Boeington, he was originally a flying tiger. He later became famous for this Marine squadron that fought the Japanese in the Pacific called the Black 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 Sheep uh, Squadron, it was called. And he had a novel he wrote about it, too, his experiences, called Ba Ba Black Sheep, of course. So a lot of, them, a lot of these were early Americans that were kind of already starting to fight the Japanese uh, at the beginning of the war. Uh, they were famous for their uh, P-40 Warhawks, uh, which were these uh, type of American uh, fighter planes that had the famous, um, I guess, tiger's teeth on them uh, that you see right there. 
But I guess he got the idea of, you know, flying tigers because of the fact that he went to LSU, which uh, their mascot is the flying ti- is the fighting tigers, fighting tigers of LSU. Now, uh, of course, the big thing that's going to really, you know, lead to, the, like I said, the United States getting in the war is the fact that the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor on uh, December 19, 1941. Uh, of course, the reasoning behind this uh, really had more to do with things that went back to 1937, when you know uh, Japan started to invade China, uh, mainland China, uh, and all that. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> a lot of it was uh, several things that, of course, caused this. Uh, one was um, the fact that the United States started sanctioning Japan because uh, the fact that they had invaded China uh, and all this. They actually started doing this way back in 1937. Uh, and the fact that the United States uh, had a bunch of these uh, neutrality acts that they passed uh, through Congress, which banned selling things to like, you know, war powers at the time. Uh, and so that had a lot to do with it. Uh, but uh, also um, one of the things that they started to put embargoes on was not just like, uh, like steel or whatever, uh, in, in, in freezing like Japanese assets, but fuel, fuel, oil, I think those are the main things that they, they would put embargoes on Japan. That that actually was something that was bad for the Japanese, but they because they really needed, you know, fuel and things like that, oil uh, to fuel their war machine. Uh, and without that, they knew that they wouldn't be able to continue this war uh, in Asia and all that uh, for, uh, you know, like, Probably, I think they only have maybe six months of fuel that they could fight with, basically. And so that's going to lead to the Japanese deciding to attack parts of like Southeast Asia uh, into the like the Dutch East Indies uh, as well, because a lot of that area is very rich in like minerals, uh, things like you know oil and so on, but also rubber, uh, which they'll need uh, as you know for the war effort. And so uh, the Japanese come up with this idea to attack the Americans, whose main, you know, Pacific fleet is, is based in Hawaii, uh, you know, Central Pacific. And so uh, a lot of these ideas were brainchilds of really two men uh, that were involved, I guess, in kind of planning the whole attack on Pearl Harbor. Of course, Admiral Yamamoto, they always talk about him, uh, who was the main admiral commander of the Japanese combined fleet. Uh, at the time, and I think the Japanese Navy wanted to kind of do something in the war because I think at this point it was all just the mil- armies, Japanese armies, just doing doing their thing in the war, and the Navy wanted to get involved <clears throat> as well. And so Yam- Yamamoto, with um, Prime Minister of Japan Hideki Tojo, they pretty much began planning this operation uh, to <clears throat> attack attack um, uh, what is um, uh, the U.S. Pacific Fleet uh, in Hawaii, uh, which that that of course would occur on December seventh, nineteen forty one, and they do think that um, this uh, actual operation was actually influenced by uh, a British attack on the Italian Navy in southern Italy, the so-called Battle of Toronto, uh, which happened in November nineteen forty, where uh, the British Navy used uh, carrier-based planes uh, to strike at the Italian Navy. I think they even used torpedo bombers. And so the Japanese got this idea that they could bomb and use torpedo bombers uh, to sink our ships. And so that's something they began planning pretty much, you know, uh, at the beginning of the war. Uh, And so um, the Japanese, uh, they would, of course, go after our main fleet, uh, which was based at Oahu, Hawaii, uh, which is the smaller island where Honolulu, the capital, is, of course, there today. And um, what Yamamoto was planning to do, that he think he was trying to either eliminate the uh, U.S. Pacific Fleet uh, or um, weaken them uh, so much that they would have to sue for peace in an early treaty, kind of like what happened with the Russians in the Russo-Japanese War uh, that happened in the early 1900s. So they're kind of planning like a sneak attack, like that surprise attack. I think the Japanese did some kind of surprise attack on their naval forces, I think it was. And so they kind of planned that same kind of thing there uh, at that point. And so the Japanese amassed this huge naval force, by the way, to attack uh, Pearl Harbor. 
Uh, it was called the First Air Fleet. That's a, kind of one of the nicknames they called it. It was a massive carrier force uh, that involved six aircraft carriers, uh, Kagi, Kaga, Soryu, Hiryu, Shikaku, and Zukaku. Uh, and um, their plan was to target a lot of the airfields, like take out, take out our airfields, uh, and then what they were going to do, uh, they were going to then uh, then go after, of course, Pearl Harbor, where our main capital ships were. Uh, and so that that became the main main plan of what what the, they were going to do, of course, at Pearl Harbor. Uh, here's kind of an old picture of the image of Pearl Harbor. Uh, you can see, by the way, that's kind of like Battleship Row to the bottom right, uh, right there. That's where we had our our main ships there. And um, yeah, these are some of the ships that were on Battleship Row when, of course, uh, the Japanese attacked with their uh, air power. Uh, USS Oklahoma, uh, the Maryland, uh, Utah, California, West Virginia, Tennessee, Nevada, and of course the most famous one, uh, the Arizona, uh, as well. And um, the attack on Pearl Harbor uh, came in two waves. Uh, of course, I kind of go show go back to that picture I just showed you of that, but they think the first wave came in about 7:55, and the second wave came in about an hour later. Uh, and uh, most of the actual damage was done in the first attack. I don't think there was less to attack after that, uh, pretty much. And um, the attack on Pearl Harbor, by the way, would damage, I think, as many as like something like 18 ships or more uh, were sunk or destroyed or damaged. Uh, close to 2,500 men uh, were killed and some civilians also and uh, two sh out of the different ships, uh, at the capital ships that were, of course, attacked at Pearl Harbor, uh, USS Arizona, uh, USS Oklahoma were, were really the damage the most, which were never raised again uh, afterwards. I think I've got images showing, of course, uh, the Arizona uh, exploding. Uh, they suppose a bomb hit the magazine uh, of the Arizona and actually raised the ship when it exploded. Uh, and... Um, there was a man on board, I don't know if you know, his name was, uh, the rear admiral was using his flagship for that, uh, which was Isaac Kidd. Uh, and so, uh, if you know, later they built a famous destroyer called the USS Kidd, which is named after him. So that's why Baton Rouge wanted the USS Kidd so bad, because uh, it's associated with the you know attack on Pearl Harbor. So that's where the Kidd got its name, because Baton Rouge, we have the USS Kidd that's here, of course, that's on the Mississippi River if you want to go see it. But yeah, the Arizona was hit uh, half the men uh, that pretty much died uh, at, you know, pretty much Pearl Harbor were killed on the Arizona. In fact, 80% of the crew of the Arizona were killed, which sounds like 1,200-something men, uh, basically. And, uh, yeah, there, of course, there's the famous Arizona Memorial, uh, which is there now. You can see the bottom of it, uh, part of the uh, Arizona is still there. Uh, and you can see there's still oil coming out of it right there, which some people kind of, remark about it sometime that it's the tears of the of the sailors that's actually coming out of it uh, and not the oil uh there's the maryland on the left but the oklahoma on the right it actually flipped over on its side almost turned turtle and they actually had men that were trapped inside of it they couldn't get out uh, which i think i think till christmas they heard people banging on the hole and so you had people that died that were inside of it or drowned uh basically uh, that later they raised the Oklahoma. You can see the Oklahoma there at the top, next to a later battleship they built called the USS Wisconsin. So you can see how big these battle wagons get later in the war. We built a lot of battleships, of course, in the war, but car carriers become more important if you know about it uh, in in War II, especially in the Pacific War. Uh, that was the USS Shaw. It was like a ship in dry dock that got hit. Uh, by a bomb, and it just blew up into a huge explosion, and that's kind of what you're looking at uh, right there with that explosion. So that that basically causes the United States to enter enter the war at this point. You have, of course, Franklin D. Roosevelt, the President of the United States, would give his famous Day of Infamy speech. That's considered also one of the most famous speeches, too, uh, in American history, done on December 8th, 1941, uh, in front of Congress. And um, 
what's going to happen right afterwards, because of the fact that the United States has declared war on Japan because of the, you know, the tripartite pact that we talked about before, what ends up happening, Germany and Italy come in uh, because of what happens with Japan. And so December 11th, 1941, they, they declare war uh, on, on the United States. And so at that point, that's pretty much when you get the different alliances systems that are you know, pretty much set at that point. You've got the Axis powers on one side, Nazi Germany, uh, Japan, and Italy. And then on the other side, you've got pretty much Great Britain, the United States, uh, Soviet Union, and the Republic of China that's, that's fighting uh, you know, pretty much throughout the war. So yeah, there's other powers that fight, you know, also in World War II, but those are the main ones that, that pretty much uh, win. Of course, the United States and the Soviets end up coming out ahead, you know, that's what leads to the Cold War later. But next week, uh, I'm going to move on. I'll talk about the end of the war. Uh, of course, from 1942 to 45 onward, the Allies are going to start winning. Uh, I think they consider 1942 to be the turning point, of course, uh, in in World War II, and so we'll, we'll we'll see. Of course, that of course happened. Of course, next week, and then also I'll, I'll also be kind of moving on to uh, talk about uh, as well, uh, like I said, the Cold War. So don't forget, uh, you got assignments out there. Of course, you will need to work on second exam. Of course, the main thing I should be working on right now. Uh, World War One quiz is out uh, as well, and then don't forget, vocab is going to be I think due starting this weekend. Uh, yeah, I usually give you a week, turn that in, you know, stagger those, uh, I guess, uploads for that. Uh, same thing with a book report. Book report, you want to start turning those in early, you can uh, over the weekend. But uh, I think Monday is when they, they'll be start being due. So I'll give you a week on that, too, uh, to get that turned in uh, as well. But that's it for today. I don't think it was any historical questions that anybody uh, asked me uh, for today. But if you have a comment, question about this, uh, lecture, you can always make a comment, of course, on my channel uh, as well. Or if you had a comment about the class, you can also email me. So y'all take take care uh, and have a great weekend, of course, uh, coming up. And of course, I'll, I'll see you next week. Uh, spring break, of course, is coming you know, soon, uh, I think after next week. So y'all take care. Have a great weekend coming up.